change in which you see in the world. I wonder, I wonder what you would do if you had the power to dream at night any dream you wanted to dream. And you would, of course, be able to alter your time sense and slip, say, 75 years of subjective time into eight hours of sleep. You would, I suppose, start out by fulfilling all your wishes. You could design for yourself what would be the most ecstatic life love affairs, banquets, dancing girls, wonderful journeys, uh, gardens, music beyond belief. And then after a couple of months of this sort of thing, and 75 years a night, you would be getting a little uh, taste for something different. And uh, you would move over to an adventurous dimension where there were certain dangers involved and the thrill of dealing with dangers. And you could rescue princesses from dragons and go on dangerous journeys, make wonderful explosions and blow them up, eventually get into contest with enemies. And after you've done that for some time, you think up a new wrinkle to forget that you were dreaming. So that you would think it was all for real. And to be anxious about it. Because it'd be so great when you woke up. And then you'd say, well, like children who dare each other on things, how far out could you get? What could you take? What dimension of being lost, of abandonment of your power, what dimension of that could you stand? You could ask yourself this because you know you'd eventually wake up. And after you'd gone on doing this, you see, for some time, you'd suddenly find yourself sitting around in this room with all your personal involvements, problems, etc. Uh, talking with me. How do you know that that's not what you're doing? Could be. Because after all, what would you do if you were God? If you were what there is, the self. In the Upanishads, the basic text of Hinduism, one of them starts out saying, in the beginning was the self. And looking around, it said, I am. And thus it is that everyone to this day, when asked who is there, says it is I. If you were God, and in the sense that you knew everything, You would be bored. Because if looking at it from another way, we push technology to its furthest possible development, and we had, instead of a dial telephone on one's desk, a more complex system of buttons, and one touch would give you anything you wanted. Aladdin's lamp. You would eventually have to introduce a button labeled surprise. <laughs> because all perfectly known futures, as I pointed out, are past. They have happened, virtually. It is only the true future is a surprise. So if you were God, you would say to yourself, man, get lost. Damn.
that was some powerful stuff. <laughs> I love Alan Watts. Join the crew, man. Alan Watts is my favorite uh, philosopher. Ladies and gentlemen, we just started this podcast uh, with a little intro by Alan Watts. We thought it would be a good catalyst to uh, bring about the discussion on philosophy and crazy topics that I like to cover on this podcast. Here you can see our beautiful faces. This is Alex Boyd, ladies and gentlemen, one of my favorite brothers from another mother. He is a deep soul that likes to have these psychedelic conversations with me, and I thought I'd have him, I would have him down here on the Crucial Journey podcast. What do you think of that, brother? The Alan Watts? Alan Watts, yeah. Or your introduction. Well, both. <laughs> I mean, clearly my introduction was totally awesome, man, because I'm just such a beautiful, connoisseur beautiful. of words. It was good. I mean, I, I was having a lot of thoughts during I was thinking about how not only do I love how Alan Watts breaks things down in such just a simple and mm -hmm. easy to understand and... Try to speak up to the microphone just a little bit. I want to get your deep, sexy voice in there. Easy to understand, but also paints things in such an elegant light. Is It's fantastic. Like, he's... I don't know. He's just a great philosopher. At the same time, I don't like how the... I don't know if you've seen the Alan Watts Dream of Life stuffs a lot. I think I've seen that one as well. But I don't like how it has such a, a focus on the conscious choice of surprise or the conscious mind of God. And the thing I don't like about that is the fact that it seems a little too human for me. I'm more like to lean towards the McKenna idea of the universe is not only stranger than we suppose but it's stranger than we can suppose and that whole hey let's take a random walk through history mm -hmm. press the surprise button is a little bit oversimplified for my taste well you see that's what i love about the conversation because i see it from a completely different perspective mm. um i'm definitely more of an alan watts boy yeah and the thing i love about that is it's the one thing that to me explains this idea of us in the Eastern schools of thoughts being basically uh, an aspect of God. I mean, if we look at ourselves, the way that we behave, and we kind of look at the situation as to what we would do in a situation where we knew everything, hmm. you basically get bored. You'd 100%. have to, you'd want a surprise button. So using that analogy, basically what I believe Alan Watts is trying to do through the explanation is that talk about a situation where God is this omnipotent being that knows everything so is omniscient omnipotent blah 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 blah. clearly if he has the same characteristics that us humans would have it seems the logical thing to do to want to want to surprise yourself and the Experience only way to do that novelty. is to well yeah the only way to do that in my mind is to create a universe where you don't know everything and i guess there isn't this perfection i guess that um that you would see if you were in only a perfect universe where there is no surprise a hundred percent and the more people you talk to that experience out of out of body experiences or, or going to realms above and below mm -hmm. often talk about how they experience cities of light or, or very one-dimensional tracks of of positivity yeah, yeah. Or, or negativity and then you come here and there's this this balance of good and bad that leads to constant change and diversity yeah before we get too deep into this because you and i we always go deep let me Very. just uh get this thing rolling ladies and gentlemen in case i didn't do it justice before this is the crucial journey podcast this is my soulful brother alex over here and every once in a while i like to get these uh these intellectual soul brothers as i like to call them down just to discuss these trippy topics uh, i guess a lot of hippies like to have these uh these conversations, and this is what my podcast is about, having these hippie-like conversations, and obviously talking about the state of the world, talking about music, girls, and all the stuff that we usually talk about, but we rarely set a, a time to, uh, to delve into. So this is a good opportunity to, to have these one-on-one -on -one conversations and things like that. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, if you do like this podcast, be sure to share it. I think I am on YouTube, Stitcher, as it shows over here and iTunes, and uh, yo, just tell a friend, I mean, that's the best way to uh, to promote something in this day and age, just the word of mouth, and uh, yeah, support this thing if you want to hear more about this, more conversations like this, rather. Uh, let's get this ball rolling, I'm just going to do my introduction, and we can uh, pick up this conversation again. Boom. 
I feel like the ball hasn't really started to roll until I do the introduction music. Yeah. So who's in your introduction music, by the way? I heard uh, a couple of voices there. We got all my favorite speakers. So um, to begin with, that's Bruce Lee. Yeah. You must be water. <laughs> you must. You must become one with the universe. What was that? An exhibition? That needs a lot of work. Needs a lot of work. <laughs> um, and uh, I think I got some Martin Luther King in there. Yeah. Um, let me try Martin Luther King actually, because I do that pretty well being a black person, oh. obviously. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where we'll not be judged by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. That was like halfway between Martin Luther and Martin Luther King and Charlie Chaplin's speech in The Great Dictator. Well, they're they're too good uh, uh, speakers, so it wasn't. <laughs> but I don't think it was quite what I wanted. Uh, I was also, impressed. Nonetheless. Also, thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. That's right. Also, had some Jason Silver in there. Jason yeah. Silver is what I call a wordsmith. He's one of these guys that yeah. just, you know, captivates you. It's it's like he is casting a spell as well, his, he... His level of energy is just so intense that yeah. it's hard not to get caught up in it. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the one thing that I love the most about entertainers. My favorite entertainers are people that are just full of enthusiasm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the very word enthusiasm, I, I believe the, the meaning means to have God within you. Mm. And... Uh, I feel like when people are passionate about something, regardless of what it is, you want to listen to them. Yeah. And or when people are yeah, when people have have a drive behind them, or, or they know who they are, and they they sit so firmly in their beliefs that they just they have this energy about them that enthralls you. I mean, it's it's entertainers and, and shamans have the same thing where people who who meet with with a shaman who's the real deal will talk mm -hmm. about how they just have this level of peace which you can't help but fit into. It's something else. Absolutely. I, I feel the same way. Um, but brother, you know, before we got into this uh, this podcast over here, we're talking about uh, the topic, one of my favorite topics. We topic about? women, man. Women. women, man. We were, one of our <laughs> favorite conversations, I think, is whether or not guys and girls oh, are different. Now, clearly, I think to most sane people, I don't mean to bring, bring it down over here, I but let's, let's be real. There is clearly differences. I would say I would go as far as saying that the biggest difference, the biggest distinctions that could ever manifest themselves in this universe, or that we see in this universe, or at least on this planet, are the distinctions between femininity, femininity. I can't even pronounce it right. Uh, femininity. Fem femininity and masculinity, yep. male, female, the yin and yang. I think to say that there isn't a distinction between those two is like. But would you well, also what what is distinction then? But would you also deny that you don't have a balance of those two energies within yourself? That you don't have a balance? Well, is that oh I so my some, question is I hear what you're saying. I, I think I understand the question now. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. So you're saying you're asking whether or not you lean more to the other, or no, I'm or whether saying, or not you're balanced in no. My, in my question femininity. is simply: Do you think men have a level of of feminine energy within them and do you think women have a level of masculine oh, absolutely. energy within them? absolutely without a and doubt so while there are differences mm -hmm. do you think there are other than like let's let's get a bit woo woo and say we're talking about mm -hmm. what, what's inside okay then do you think the differences are biological or do you think they're social i think it's a combination of both i think it's very clear that there are certain hormones within the male species that affect their psychology yeah more than just the physiology 100%. testosterone is is a crazy drug man yeah stop but the not... cocaine testosterone makes guys do the most ridiculous things absolutely and but uh what if i mean not not what if but wouldn't you say through in our current society that mm -hmm. at least this is my belief is that men are brought through life being pushed to sport to uh, yeah, com competitiveness to combat to, to a, a dominating and controlling yeah it's the uh, nature versus nurture argument you're basically saying that the environment influences what you're leaning towards masculinity or femininity because as, as well as well, well what I'm saying is that mm. the environment influences your level of testosterone and estrogen um, without a doubt uh, without a doubt I mean there's plenty of evidence to show that in uh, and yeah. so women, in certain situations, women are raised. For to... instance, watching pornography increases the level of testosterone within your body. There you go. Yeah. So, so obviously, if you're in an environment where there's lots of sex going on, you're going to be more masculine. Naturally. Huh. Yeah. I don't know about my logic there, but, but yeah. But so women are raised <laughs> to be receptive to, to 
expect to have a husband or, or in our current society that's starting to change mm-hmm. but to be demure to be sensitive to be what is demure shy shy or, okay. or cute or, or kind of uh, mm-hmm. uh receptive really to, to not take center stage to mm-hmm. be prepared to step back mm-hmm. and all right thanks thanks female krishna that's, thank that's you beautiful i like being demure um and and so when you get a, a girl who's who's got one of those dads who always wanted a boy, yeah, and and they've got a male name, they tend to lean towards a more masculine side. Absolutely, of the feminine no spectrum. disagreement there. There, being astute, oh, I hate saying that. It sounds so freaking. <laughs> yeah, I'm being a student psychology man, pulling rank of here. Clearly, I understand. No, all I'm saying is that someone that is hugely into psychology and realizes how big a play, play that is mm. in human development. You're not getting any disagreement with me there that your yeah. environment, the way that you've been brought up, shapes, you. uh, shapes your even your physiology. However, I would also say, as you know, your physical attribute, your physiology, the fact that you were a, a male, that you have a penis, that you have certain hormones that are running through you, they definitely affect you as well. And I would say Absolutely. when Absolutely. it comes to masculinity and femininity, to address your initial question, whether or not I think it's more a physical thing or a, a, I don't know if you want to refer to it as soul, or cu- what I would say is, Definitely, your physiology affects whether or not you're more masculine or feminine. And likewise, but you also, won't get any disagreements from me there. Yeah, and also your environment. But I would also say there is something even within the, uh, I, I would say the soul, the uh, the essence of you. I'd say that, um, I know this is going very metaphysical over here, but... It's a good way to go. Yeah, there are definitely, in my opinion, um, yeah, I'm not sure if I fully thought this out, but I feel as if there I don't are, agree with you on it personally. Yeah, I definitely feel as if your the the fundamental aspect of you may lean more towards masculinity or femininity, and that's going to well, ha- no, no, have no. A, what I mean is that yeah, uh, my my I, I get in the camp of we are all one manifesting ourselves in infinite diversity, and okay. therefore when you get to the source, we're all the same. Oh, so from the t- from you know by virtue of that, you you would imply that. If you, let's say, you go into a physical body, let's say we're all, all the source and obviously we, uh, we, we take birth, uh, your vehicle that you're using, the vehicle that you're using to express yourself is going to manifest masculine or feminine qualities, but ultimately we're all the same essence. So if we link it back to the Alan Watts thing, for example, you hit mm-hmm. the surprise button and boom. 20, 20, 30 years later, whatever, you're Krishna, you're having a bad in front of the TV, I don't know, whatever happens, mm-hmm. you've, you've got your masculinity. Next time you hit the surprise button, who knows, you may be a female. Yeah, I've thought about that a lot, and it scares the hell out of me. As much it's, as I love, very yeah, I love women, the idea of actually being a woman and like being really into guys and like, oh, you're so sexy, oh, he's big, he's got thick penis. It's like, ah! Oh! I mean, as much, much as I joke about that, it's like, whoa, so I have to be into guys now? That's weird. But that's, in the, you know what that is. That's just ego and social conditioning. That's true. But I, I guess I look at myself as being part of my ego like i'm looking at this from a spiritual perspective like let's say your source it's so hard to disconnect my ego from source like i, I look at my masculinity at least in the uh the way i'm looking at it now as being connected to who i am in my utmost state but obviously i don't know if that's actually the case well is ego a spiritual construct or is it a construct of the monkey mind that's a hard one for me to even understand. Uh, yeah, what, no, I don't. I mean, I mean, because you say it's hard to for me to, to separate myself source, from source, source yeah. and ego. Yeah, but I think source is is the wall. In, sorry, ego is the wall in front of the the soul or the ego is is your physical construct. Mm-hmm. Is how I see it, and what lies beyond that has no ego to it. I would agree with that. That makes sense. But addressing the point as to whether or not guys and girls are different. The fact that, <laughs> I forgot what you Yeah, we, we kind of uh, went, went <laughs> tangentially speaking as, uh, our, as our friend Christopher Ryan. Um, big fan of that podcast. Thanks for hooking me onto that, by the way. That's become... I actually going to say it's become my favorite podcast at the moment, tangentially speaking. Yeah. Um, yeah. The guy, yeah. The guy's got a deep voice and it's very calming to listen to. I'm like, why do I sound like that? Damn it. I love his scientific background and his, mm-hmm. and his stories are just fantastic. He's had a, had a very interesting life. Yeah. Um, Mine's have been Psychedelic Salon with Lorenzo Haggerty. Okay. Mainly Trilogues. Rupert Sheldrake, Terence McKenna, and Ralph Abraham. That is some very uh, 
classical stuff that you're getting into yeah. there. Well, I, I started at the very start as well. I started yeah, so at the, I. the I, first one, and I've been moving forward through all the trilogues. Yeah. And then I'm going to deviate into into more Alan Watts and more... Uh, man, there was someone else I saw recently that I really... Uh, Michael Pesk. Michael Pesk. Yeah. Pesk? I, I don't know how it's pronounced. All right. But... Um, I really like him as well. The more I hear, the more I'm interested. So outside of Terence McKenna, have we picked a favorite? Yeah. Uh, it's too early to tell. It's too too early to tell. I yeah. mean, I'll always I'll always be a a, a big fan of McKenna. Absolutely. Uh, but for the audience listening, I refer to them as the audience. Like I'm actually in a show right now. <laughs> you but, are uh, on a show. This is yes, your man. podcast. Now, but the whole idea is that we're not on a show. We're just having a conversation. You know. True. Otherwise, you get all self conscious. Oh, like, am I? Am I? Am I? Is my is my mouth too big right now? Am I, my hair? Do I look pretty? My, well, who cares, man? Um, yeah, I would say that you probably lean more towards Terence McKenna, who was the the godfather of mushrooms and psychedelic trips. Yeah, although and, reading Dennis McKenna's book recently kind of mm-hmm. painted an, another picture for me as well. Of, mm-hmm. I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Dennis as well. He steps much more into the realism camp, which I love. And reading that book, realism. Really, so we're talking about hard science, materialistic science. science. Okay. Um, I mean, uh, for anyone that's familiar with the McKenna brothers. Mm-hmm. McKenna stepped away from science and culture and, and decided that science cannot give us the answers we want. Whereas Dennis uh, is still going through the process of trying to create an al- alchemical wedding. As Absolutely. As Which is what I'm all about, my friend. I know. I, I love the like fact you started using weddings. that, yeah. I just said it because yeah. I knew you'd love it. Absolutely. <laughs> and I, can I just say that uh, I remember when you first like acknowledged me using that, like, whoa, man, like, uh, this sounds like a, I mean, you said something really cool that made me really proud. Like, uh, you know, like a guy that uses that phrase, man, like, is obviously a deep, deep, deep dude. And I'm like, oh, thank you, man. And Anyone now, that talks about alchemy gets my bet. Thanks, brother. And one of the coolest things to hear is your friends using words that you use. Like, uh, I, yeah. I, I pride myself in, like, stealing all of these really cool lines and uh, phrases that I hear in podcasts and using them, you know, and when other people start using it's like sharing something on Facebook. Do you ever it's get like, the the other side of it, though, where you click into like, oh, that's my thing. Why is he using my thing? No, it's never like that. It's nice. like some, that's awesome. Man. And well, let's be real over here. More often than not, something that you've shared has probably been shared by someone else. Absolutely. So it's like I get off in knowing that someone else is sharing something I've shared. And mm. uh, it's all part of the process about wanting to raise everyone's awareness and when you find something that is relevant to you and definitely benefits you you want other people to benefit from that as well and imitation is the finest form of flattery absolutely but uh but yeah i think well we went we went off all tangential there for a second what we're talking about we don't we don't have an original tangent to begin with yeah yeah yeah. other than men versus women yeah um but back to the whole um This was relating to... Oh, that's right. You were talking about... I wanted to get into this. You were talking about how Dennis McKenna is more materialistic and some other dude has kind of like found the synthesis between um, both the material science and the metaphysical kind of like... Which other dude? Uh, I think you mentioned Dennis McKenna is more of an either materialist... Than, than Terence. Terence, fair enough. I, um, I don't believe that science has to be materialistically inclined. I would say that science would disagree with you. Well, science would be absolutely wrong. The definition of <laughs> it all comes down to the definition. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes, going back science to, to, to Greece. Science in accordance to the scientific method. Absolutely, mm. it's a it's a process that involves obviously uh, you know come up with a hypothesis. You go about um, doing conducting experiments. You tabulate your results. It has to be falsifiable, um, testable. It goes through all of these things in order for it to be scientific. However, the actual process of science, which is derived from scientia, which is apparently the process of empiricism. What's that? To, ancient Greek? Or? Uh, I believe so, ancient yeah. Greek. So it's, it's trying to understand uh, things through experience, through mm. basically through uh, your own, through empirical data. The mm. data gained through experiences, you gain an understanding of this reality that we live in. And fair enough, with a scientific method, you obviously have to be able to test your findings and that's one of the difficulties because there are a lot of hippie things that are very hard to prove within this Euclidean meat space like how I dropped that word it's so freaking cool Euclidean uh, meat sorry, space coming, sorry, coming. yeah 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 uh, <laughs> but yeah I, I would say that um, whereas I do believe in testing I believe that the best measure of whether or not something is is through your own experience and I agree completely I think we, we touched on this last night where we were talking about you should never subscribe to anybody else's doctrine 
you should own you should base all of your findings on personal experience well I'm a big fan of subscribing into someone else's doctrine provided it resonates and you've tested it like what I have an issue with is people that buy into something purely because everyone else is doing it yeah absolutely it's, it's or or people that see I have a problem with people that can't look at other alternatives so when someone is so in their camp that they can't have a rational discussion about any other camps yeah i hear what you're saying there i do respect that point because <laughs> I, I see myself doing that in but, a lot of regards as you as you say that like, i'm talking about krishna over here i'm not i'm, not, uh, I'm really uh, but, talking about uh hardcore catholics okay a few in particular that i know um absolutely because i can i can have a conversation and me and you can have an argument without absolutely. without things getting personal and without yeah without uh, demoralizing each other. Absolutely, that's definitely necessary. I do believe in looking at the other alternatives. Uh, it's basically skepticism, the true definition of it, which is refraining from judgment until you're more conversant with the facts. Once you are conversant with the facts... See, I still... don't think it has to be skepticism, because I don't think you have to have to make anything negative or, or look with a, with a darkened view on anything. But that's the thing. How is skepticism negative? I suppose, what do you mean by skepticism? When I, when I say skepticism, I'm saying before you make a judgment, you actually look at all the facts, all the data. You yeah. refrain from judging until you understand what's going on, as opposed to people that see um, a pig fly, you know, and they go, oh, it's true, pigs fly, when it actually was a, um, a pig attached to some kind of remote control device. And <laughs> all or, I'm saying, or a, a hot air balloon. Absolutely. Uh, all like I'm saying is get your facts, do the research, um, don't be so quick to judge, and then once you have an understanding of what's going on, then make a decision. Like refrain from judging until you are more conversant with the facts, absolutely, and that is necessary absolutely. in every th in in every situation when you're trying to um, accumulate more knowledge. I hundred percent agree. Yeah, I just feel as if um, there are certain issues, um, things specifically dealing with morality, where I have to, I internally, um, it's not that I haven't looked at all the alternative, looked at the alternative. It's that I have arrived at what I feel to be the truth. And when someone has a viewpoint in contrary to that, it's uh, like, I guess it comes across as me not wanting to look at their viewpoint, but it's the fact that I've already made up my mind in having looked at the alternative information and just being so emphatically in disagreement to uh, the other alternative, if you know what I mean. See, I always like to be, this is what I believe. Mm. But you could prove me wrong. Um, there are certain things where I feel as if I would not want to accept the option of being proven wrong. Yeah. Not out of ego, out of if there is another alternative to this, I don't want to exist in this universe. See? And this is one of our favorite conversations. Can't get behind that. Yeah, well, here's the thing. Here's the thing. There are certain things that happen in this world, just so that you understand where I'm coming from, that I look at as being horrible, yeah, yeah, yeah. as being the worst thing. And at the risk of this becoming a full-blown, you know, because yeah, yeah, yeah. one of the co common arguments we have is that you're a proponent of there is no right, there is no wrong. I'm a proponent of the idea that there are axiomatic principles inherent within the universe. What I mean by that is that there are basic laws that govern the universe, not just physical laws, but when we're dealing with morality, there is such a thing as right and wrong. I'm not saying I know what they all are, or if any of them, but I'm definitely saying that they exist. To take on the attitude that there is no definitive right and wrong means that everything is up in the air. When someone is doing the worst evil, it's just, it's, it's neither good or bad. It's just the way things are. And I cannot accept that because I see a lot of the destruction that goes on in the world. And for me to accept that this is just, it's just, it just is, and there isn't some kind of wrongdoing, to me it's a defeatist attitude. And it means that you're not trying to elevate yourself towards truth. As a philosopher, you have to believe in the idea of, of, of wisdom, truth. I mean, philosophy is derived from, basically, philosophy means a lover of, not lover, lover of wisdom, mm. the idea of truth. If you believe that there is no truth, that means that there's no point to even wanting to search for truth. See, I don't think that there is no truth, per se. My big thing is that... Well, isn't truth right or wrong? Like, isn't truth, like, the what is, what is correct? How, do you, how else would you define truth by saying... So what, what does that have to do with good? Because my right. thing is that Everything. in our existence or yeah. in, in, this, in this conscious realm that we embody, mm -hmm. we have good and bad. Yes. But they're also relative concepts. What I consider good is not necessarily what you consider good. Yes. And so when you go over to really understand whether something is good or bad, you have to understand the motivation behind it. 
I agree with what you're saying to an extent. I do understand that there's a subjective nature involved, but if we if we define it as what causes harm, what is all selfishness, all right? There are definitely some things that are more selfish than others. If we have a spectrum going on over here. But there's also, see, see this is where things also murky for me, is that yeah. there's a fine line between pl pain and pleasure. And I know people in pain would not necessarily agree with that, but I think when you have what people call transcendental experiences yes you get you get a lot of both and they're not always granted they're not always black and white i would agree that there are definitely a lot of grays in there but i would also say that there are definitely a lot of full-blown definitive uh blacks and whites out there in a situation where someone decides to sacrifice a baby because and, and chop it up into little pieces be purely because he feels as if it's going to benefit him and bring rain <laughs> in a situation like that for someone to say that it is it's neither good or bad. It is just the way that the universe works. I would have called fucking bullshit on that. And so I still no, swear, man. I'd say it's, by our culture of standards, that's fucking evil. But, well, I, well, here's but whether that carries in an infinite, infinite pattern... Yeah. I don't have enough knowledge to... Let's to ground myself let's, in let's, one let's start it. because to fully address this, we have to define what is good mm -hmm. and what is evil. Because this is what it gets down to. To me... Uh, the best definition that I've come across is when is when something is extreme. I mean, let's say we have a scale. One side, altruism. So basically doing things for others. Yeah. Other side, complete and utter selfishness, right? Mm. When I would say that you are doing something that is on the extreme pole of selfishness mm. and it is, it is detrimentally affecting someone else, that I think is a good definition for evil. Mm. And based on that definition... I would say that if someone is doing something that is selfish by, let's say, killing a baby, believing that it's going to bring about goodness to his crops, all right, selfishly motivated, and it is this extreme detriment of someone else, that fits in my definition of evil. But so, to, the alternative of saying that there is no, there is no distinction between anything, like there, are no, there isn't a sliding scale of good and evil, it's just everything is the same. That's something I feel that I would have to be insane. I'm sorry to say this, but to, to accept. I'm not saying that you were insane. I'm saying that that viewpoint to me, Call me insane. it comes a, But to you, I can understand that my viewpoint is insane, but I can't accept I it. Don't, no, 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 I don't think you're insane by any means. But yeah, I, mean, I, was reading a, I was reading a good article today about how science is, is getting closer to seeing the link between creativity and insanity. And so... I mean, I, I just threw that because you were talking about insanity, yeah. and I. Oh, I like thank that you. I, I actually like the idea of insane now. But I'd like to link this back to the Alan Watts thing again and say, mm -hmm. so if you're, if you're, uh, to use woo woo terms, God, and mm -hmm. you're clicking your surprise button, yeah, to go into a realm of balance of good and bad, of yes and no, yeah, then the logic behind that is that that isn't existing in the realm that you are prior to this, correct? <laughs> That was a hard one to swallow. I may actually need to hear Let that. Let me again. rephrase this. Is what, this what happens with trippy conversations. Sometimes <laughs> they go over my head. So Need more processing power. Wish I could just upgrade RAM into my chip right now. Ew! Oh! Yeah, I totally understand that. Well, that's a very interesting stipulation. Well, it would seem that it would, based, it would be based on... <laughs> Obviously, I need more RAM. But to, uh, to clarify that again, do you mind? So, the idea is that We've put ourselves in a position of balance, of constant change through through good and evil, yin and yang forces okay. that shape our reality. We've got domination, destruction, war, devastation. Mm -hmm. And we've got hippies, shamans, life, peace, love, communes, and group sex. Okay. And so we've put ourselves in this position to receive pleasure and pain to have that balance of good and evil mm -hmm. so we can experience pleasure because without the without the, the pain bound, yeah. the pleasure doesn't exist all is simply being I'm, I'm not I mean we may not identify it as pleasure anymore because it just simply is what we become accustomed to but I would well, still say once that, you know everything yeah. all you can do is be yeah but it's if you're in a state of absolute pleasure 24-7, it doesn't mean that that pleasure doesn't exist because you haven't experienced pain before. Well, I'd say... In my opinion. I'd say the pleasure would be lessened, in my opinion. Yeah. Because, I mean... I, I, I do understand that. It's kind of like if you haven't had water for several days. Oh, it's so yeah. goddamn good. Absolutely. And if you, if you smoke weed every day for a month... 
but at the end of the month, you won't be having nearly as much fun as you started. To an extent, I understand that. And that's the thing. More often than not, the arguments that I disagree with you making, <laughs> they have merit to an extent. But like, I can definitely see the, uh, the subjective nature of good and evil. That yeah. comes into play in a lot of things. I, mean, really, I think there are a lot of great things, but to it's a it's a completely different thing to say that there is no good or evil because of that. That in philosophy is called which is not what I'm saying at all. Well, you are you're saying there's no right and wrong. No, no, no. I'm saying you I'm, actually did just say that. Away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did I? Did I? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, well, that's what I, we're I, about. I have been saying. I think you're putting words in my mouth. I have been saying I don't sit in either camp. Completely. I don't have enough knowledge so to you, make a decision. Oh, you don't make... All right. So you're not saying either. You're, I'm saying I'm saying that within this reality, we have relativity. What stands beyond that, I haven't been able to measure, and therefore I can't make a decision. I'm going to call you out on this, because from a logical point means. of view... it. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong, right? But I just made the point that there has to be good and evil, and you said that you don't um, agree with that. Am I correct? Like it didn't, I it's not, necess it, not necessarily the case. In, a, in, in an infinite... Not, yeah, not necessarily, right? Like you're not sure. It may or may not be. But one thing I can say, right, from a logical point of view, mm. is that there either has to be no good or evil, or there has to be good or evil. <laughs> like to say that... But can't, there be, it's can't it's, there be good and good and evil in neighborhood A, and just good in neighborhood B, and just evil in neighborhood C, and neighborhood D has good, evil, Marklar, and Sklamablu? Yeah, but that's still that immaterial to my point. Understand. It would still it's either not. be good or evil, or but it's not, not exist. Infinite. But it's not infinite. All I can say is that in this reality that I'm in right now, this three-dimensional, maybe four-dimensional yeah, reality, yeah, yeah. it has to be either one or the other. It cannot exactly. be both. And unless we're living in the paradoxes, which is what all these hippies... Yeah, it's like, it's all happening at the same time, and, like, you're here, but you're not here. And, like, there's good, and there's evil, and then there's, like, neither as well. It just depends on, like, how you look at it, and nothing is. It's which is why I completely agree with you, that in this reality, there yeah. is good and evil. Yeah. In this reality. But you can't say shit about what's in any other realities. Sure, but unless... I'm talking about this reality. The physical reality, correct? Absolutely. Which has nothing to do with transcendental good and evils. You're being tricky right now, mm. aren't you? You're well, being tricky. I, I think you're, we've you're gotten a... ourselves into a debate, brother. Well, it's which just... is why we shouldn't have got too deep into this topic because we we always do. It's what it's what good lawyers do, though. I that found they true, try to yeah, change yeah, yeah. the uh, the parameters of the conversation. It's like, well, I yeah, like what you're saying too. may be true in this reality, <laughs> but in another third, fourth dimensional reality, that may not actually apply. <laughs> Well, so, but what if, what if the, yeah. in, the assassination of JFK uh, required... Uh, I think that tangent's <laughs> too far off. But, no, I mean, but my thing is about the fact that, that our measures of relativity have only been measured, or, or our, our basis on... Let's go back to science, because our basis of science has only, in, in an industrial complex, has only been around for you know, like a hundred... 50 years you mm -hmm. could say and so so our measures of speed and light of time and how time works of good and bad other than uh, long-standing mm -hmm. cultural concepts are very recent concepts in very small spaces in the universe absolutely we only have measures on one planet in one solar system Okay. So, so how can we say laws, yeah. that gravity doesn't work differently oh, we know it does. 300 yeah. parsecs away and so does good and evil. You, oh, see, because that's a, that's, yeah. The touche, to an extent, that you're saying not only physical laws may change, but maybe moral laws change in different planets as well. I'm somehow. open to the concept. And if we believe in alternate dimensions, then that stands far okay, higher you have a to point be there. realistic. I would say that using conventional science, though, we understand that where is there are certain elements that change in different planets, we understand that the major principles that govern the universe, the strong force, the weak force, electromagnetism, gravity, they are pretty Space much force. at a constant. The flash. And they are at a precise um, measurement. Pretty constant? Well, yeah, like a precise measurement. If they were even to change... In conventional bio, science? In conventional science. Because... At least according to... Uh, Mr. Neil deGrasse Tyson. Because I've heard a good, a good let's call it a story, because I don't know about the facts about when we were originally measuring the speed of light. Yes. In which it was different on the Thursday from the Tuesday. Yeah, yeah. And so we went, no, that can't be right. It must be an incorrect measurement. Yeah. I've the heard speed it. of light is always this measurement. And since all our basis of science is on the fact that mm. we have a fixed point 
of measurement for the speed yeah. of light, which is not a fact. You make a good point. So it may actually be changing in different planets. Touche. I, I concur to that. I was just going to make the point that conventionally, though, we've agreed upon the idea that these things, these certain forces that govern the universe are constant. Therefore, when well, I think that agreement is slowly dissipating. I would agree with that. The whole idea of science is that we're learning more and more, right? Absolutely. And we're learning how wrong we actually are. And the more, I mean, going back to you talking about how science doesn't need to be completely empirical in our, our sense of it, that it has to be uh, tried and tested and been able to show to other people, well, is becoming a more common argument that we need to open science up to more metaphysical principles. That's true. Just to correct, I was saying it needs to be, it doesn't need to be so scientific method-wise. Yes, it's yes, the so heart I, of it I being um, um, in, yeah, well. in, empirical. I mean, if we go back into ancient times, Hermes Trismegistus was, uh, was one of the original scientists, like the old school originators, as they say. Yeah. And, uh, I know who that is. well, okay, well, let me edify you, my brother. Tell me, tell me. <clears> brother. We're going to delve into some deep esoteric knowledge over yeah, here. Okay. This, is my, this is my specialty. Hermes Trismegistus, there was a time when I wanted to use the name Trismegistus because I thought it was so cool because no one sounds, knew what it was. It's it sounds like, like a famous magician. Is, yeah, this, this Tristan Magistus character, like, what is that? Well, actually, Tristan Magistus lived in, like, uh, but it's really probably not the coolest <laughs> name. But it basically. It's a pretty cool name. Well, thank you, Matt. It means three times great. Hermes Tristan Magistus was a master of the three most important disciplines in ancient Egypt. And if I, I remember correctly, one dealt with technology, mm. another dealt with the study of. Of physics, of the of the underlying building blocks of reality, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm just going to take a guess and say that the third one is art because I'm an artist and like art is fucking cool. Probably was not that, but bottom line is the three disciplines, and he became. I think mm -hmm. art would fit into the physics part of things. You think? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Because I think art is an expression of something more. Yeah. Well, it would definitely be one physical and the other non-physical, and the uh, I believe the other one was uh, was technology. Yeah. But this guy um, brought about the. A lot of the ideas that we've we've actually discovered recently in quantum mechanics, for instance, as above, so below. I remember. Yeah, yeah that was actually found in the uh, Emerald Tablets of Toth, who, by the way, was Hermes Trismegistus, another name for him. And a basic Toth? Toth, yeah. Okay. Toth, I don't know, man. Okay. Um, may, may want to say Toth, but I don't think it sounds as cool. Is this mythology? Well, that's the thing. And check this out. Yeah, 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 check yeah, this yeah. out. Check. Right, I got it. Go, no, go. no, no, no. I got into an <laughs> argument with my friend Sonny about this. He's like, well, actually, you can't you can't say that's definitive science. Hermes Trismegistus may not have lived. It kind of sounds like he's got this really kind of... Are you know, we going to go back cool to uh, Ragnar? No. Well, we will talk about that. Because <laughs> as you know, I often say that myths Watch might, on might possibly want be one of the... Great the idea that myths are just myths is quite possibly one of the greatest myths that has ever... Uh, been perpetuated in society and, and I the got more that. the more graham hancock the more uh who's that guy i mentioned to you last night the um randall carlson yeah yeah the more we see about these great cataclysms that have actually happened yeah the more we start to turn that veil on those stories having much more uh, absolutely uh f legitimate information in them it's so hard to keep a conversation on on track because you're is, going through all yeah, of these yeah, different yeah, yeah. like uh permutations that spread forth and you're trying to like stick like not lose sight of the initial uh idea that you wanted to uh to focus on otherwise you're gonna get lost and i love it because we have so many ideas that are going out in the air absolutely but it's like oh wait wait i gotta keep i gotta keep my <laughs> side on this Real one i almost lost in. it yeah but before we go we follow up some of those um tangents um i wanted to mention that in regards to hermes trismegistus how alexander the great actually found his grave i'm pretty pretty sure i remember listening to this on um, a podcast, um, courtesy of Manly P. Hole, who was, by the way, the master of like knowledge. I, Sonny and I it. both agree that out of all the people that we have come across, there is no one that knows more about different traditions, about different things of everything. I need to I'm get just into purely it. on knowledge. I knowledge get about get everything. Yeah. Yeah, man. It's like, <laughs> what the fuck, man? Really? You're yeah. going into, yeah. So you learn about everything when you learn about Manly P. Hall. But he talks about the history of, you know, Alexander the Great apparently discovered one of, discovered his grave. So as far as we're aware, yeah, Hermes Trismegistus was a legit dude. And considering that ancient Egypt is one of the oldest uh, civilizations. But I you mean, can, you can find a grave for Jesus, can't you? I'm pretty sure you can't. You can't? I'm pretty sure, yeah, you can't. I mean, so, uh, I could record. go and put a tombstone down for oh. Merlin the Great, couldn't I? Oh, I see what we're doing now. We're being <laughs> lawyer, you're being throwing out the... That is a possibility, yeah, but... I um, mean, just because we find a grave, it doesn't prove shit. That's true. I, I guess see. it would be the corroborating evidence. Really, for me to believe in Toth, I want to see these tablets. All right, well, based on the fact that there are so oh, many writings acc accredited to this guy, he was the most pivotal figure in Egyptian, yeah. Egyptian uh, history. 
I'm inclined to think that the guy was legit. Yeah. Yeah, and it's... Uh, yeah, I mean, really, it's... I, I love how all these mythologies are showing more and more scientific language yeah. encoded and, and ancient batteries that we're finding and all these things. That's true. Um, but I still have a little little Fair enough. bout of skepticism. But Alex you know. Boyd, good to have skepticism, but i got to, I got to uh, express my disgruntled feeling when it comes Ooh. to people, not you, but people okay. looking at history. All right. Here's I got the excited thing. we're getting into. No, 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 not an argument. But here's the thing, and I might be completely stupid, so call me up on this. Criticize yeah. the frack out of me, you know? Uh, I won't do it. Well, please do it, because one of the things I'm trying to um, get comfortable with it lately, you know, because you, you, you have to get people questioning your ideas, lest you spit, spit out too much garbage. Yeah. But one of the things we I do, agree. yeah, when we're looking at the history of other civilizations, right, is we look at their recorded texts, by the way, which are just their historical information. We go, oh, okay, 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 this all seems, yes, this all seems very, very plausible. I said, I do, yes, I do believe so. Uh, <laughs> what is this? Your people were using nuclear weapons? This, this, this is preposterous. Well, this could not be. No, 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 no. Let's get rid of it. This is purely science fiction or mythological information. And that is what we do when we're looking at the Upanishads, the, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, the ancient Indian traditions. Mm. This is what we do when we're looking at the Eddas. This is the, uh, the Norse mythologies. This is what we do when we are looking at Greek mythology. Because there is a lot. I mean, we found out a while back that the story of um, Troy yeah. was actually legit. All right. Yeah. And there actually was a city. Oh. And yeah, but even well, even though we found a lot of writings were uh, basically, uh, obviously alluding to this city, basically talking about it, we were going, no, no, this stuff, this stuff sounds way too f fictitious. So in the situation with, um, so we debunk things that don't fit into our conventional knowledge. Absolutely, absolutely. And the situation with Vikings, like you know, we were talking about this the other day about how this, that TV show is mm. supposed to be loosely based on. The actual story of Ragnar Lothbrok. Yeah. He was a legit figure. You can look him up on Wikipedia. And that fascinates the hell out of me because, um, I mean, most of the stuff that we're seeing seems very credible. There's yeah. a lot of sources for it. But on the same, on the same um, historical manuscripts, you find references to Thor mm. and Baldar and Loki. As and if these, they were real people. As if they were real people. And what I conclude from that is that, without a doubt, like with most history there's definitely embellishments at hand but it's quite possible that the, there were these Norse incredible figures that were quite possibly doing what we would deem to be magical things so, so do you think these people are like Nephilim type Anunnaki like God like characters that oh. have been embodied in flesh you drop the big one well, 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 let's not all get right. too far let's into the Nephilim into camp all right, all right. but do you think Mm -hmm. They are they are these gods embodied in flesh, or do you think that they're normal people like me and you that have meditated the fuck out of their lives, or what have you, or have, and have gotten better access to to knowledge? Um, I would say quite possibly um, B and quite possibly A, but yeah, I would say I would be in line with T. S. Eliot when technology becomes sufficiently advanced. Or magic, rather, becomes sufficiently... And let me st I always stuff up this quote. It really annoys me. I think it would be technology. Yeah. When technology becomes sufficiently advanced, it becomes indistinguishable from... From magic. From magic. Yeah. Yeah. I always stuff up that one. Yeah. But yeah. You, yeah, you know what I'm saying, right? It's quite possible yeah. that these guys were just using technology, and it became like magic. That is... I think that's the most the feasible logic within our current mm. uh, standings, because... When you look at ancient Egypt, Egypt and uh, the Aztecs or the Mayans, mm -hmm. in a lot of their sculptures, they seem to be holding remote-like objects and things that don't yeah. fit into, or don't. We can't put a absolutely a, a logical. Oh yeah, that's a tool that they use for digging dirt oh, or yeah. something like that. And even with the most um, like uh, crazy creative. Uh, Analysis when you're looking at the artwork of mm. some of these mines, it's clearly spaceships that they're sitting in. Yeah. I mean, there are there's so much there's so much wall depictions of the mines being in these instrumentations where they're uh, they're traveling through space yeah. using these rocket-like devices. Well, yeah, they're and I mean, I mean, I'm not saying it happened, but I'm saying that to suggest that these guys were not depicting spacecraft vehicles, it's like what? I mean, come on, man, what else is it going to be? Well, also that the native people talk about. Uh, I can't remember who's the um, 
Who's the Mayan guy? It's uh, Quetzalcoatl, Quetzalcoatl or yeah. um, riding Feather on serp- serpent. serpents of flame and yeah. things like that, which could be likened to something like like a rocket or or something with a propulsion absolutely uh, device in it. Mm. And one of the things that gets me when I hear about these figures in history, uh, like Quetzalcoatl, uh, how they're depicted by the people of their time, the White, e- how well, bold. Well, I wasn't, I wasn't going to mention that, but how they describe the technologies that they use. You think about it in the mm. context of these people, how they're describing these technologies. Obviously not having a vast array of concepts or terminologies that we have in our, in our society. They use things like wheels within wheels or serpents flying on fire, that mm. kind of thing, which to me alludes to these technological uh, things that we have now. I mean, yeah. imagine... a uh, uh, like uh, someone from like a thousand AD trying to describe a spaceship, trying well, to describe an iPhone. Absolutely, he's obviously <laughs> going to he's going to refer to this in in terminology that I mean maybe like uh, I, I couldn't even imagine how they would try to describe some of the, some and of the stuff they have a now. Tiny universe in his hand, exactly. and it emitted light as if it came from nowhere. That's very cool, brother. That was deep, but it's... it requires that kind of creativity or. Um, yeah, it, it just, it, it, to me, it shows that these people were obviously trying to describe technology in the limited frame of what they had available. And it's quite possible they were speaking about quite advanced technologies. And I know how crazy that sounds. What do you think of the theory of a, a grandfather-type race of a seafaring nation that taught the Egyptians their knowledge and taught the Sumerians their knowledge? The Atlantis, no. um, the Atlantis civilization. I think it makes more sense than anything else that I've heard. Me too. And I know a lot of um, hardcore um, conventional scientists would disagree, but they're, being a student of Graham Hancock, being a student of people like Michael Desarin, Desarin who's an alternative historian, yeah. you have a look at the, the anecdotal evidence. When I say that, I mean the, the written evidence. There's over 30,000 text, call it religious, call it historical text of civilizations speaking about their encounters with what we would term extraterrestrials or more advanced races. Mm. And they all allude to these people, you know, from whether it's the American Indians speaking about the Kachinas, you know, that taught them everything, whether it's the Aboriginals speaking about the uh, the dreamland times, a lot of the references they give to these creatures, or whether even in South, even in Africa, where I come from, I learned not long ago that even in my hometown, Ghana, um, uh, Mali specifically, mm. they speak about a race of people. There's a race of people called the Dogon tribe, mm. and they inherited all of their knowledge from a people that came from the star Sirius. And they actually depict all of this in their stories. Mm. A, a lot of the artifacts that they have depict the stories of these creatures that came from the Sirius star. And they talk. They have information about the orbital pat- patterns of the planets that they their ancestors came from. Mm. They they have so much evidence, but. The well, bo- the thing that gets, mm. gets me is how um, how the South Americans prior to the Spanish coming mm-hmm. had sculptures and paintings and uh, depictions of white and black people, despite that they were neither. And there's they have all the markings that are expected of those physiological people. The white people have white people features they're not just painted white yeah and i mean i know i'm being a little bit uh a non-pc with my white uh, people stop. black people Who cares about yeah, pc man as long as your intentions um, are pure that's it yeah um and so there's that whole uh, uh viracochas and, and quetzalcoatl were white bearded men with no hair that came from across the sea knew all this information Quite and possibly. seemed to be from some sort of grandfather race does Wayne Hancock speak about this a lot yeah, it sounds, it's in, yeah it's in Fingerprints of the Gods it's, yeah that's where I'm uh, but it, it seems to me that look it may not necessarily be an extra, ex, extraterrestrial phenomenon yeah I wasn't but, going down that path yeah. at this point but without a doubt we talk about how um the first time that we saw white people come into these indigenous countries was, let's say, with Captain Cook it, time or, let's say, whatever time it was. The official time, mm. there's so many other references of this happening. Like, yeah. I think it's quite possible that, um, yeah, that these races were discovered, uh, sorry, that other races traveled to other civilizations much, much um, prior and to gave what them we... the gift of better technology. Absolutely. But that's the fascinating thing about the planet, man. The history of it is confusing well confusing Murky. and fascinating beyond belief absolutely i mean i think i remember this term about how uh, just dealing with how reality is more wilder than the most 
thought of um i think this is shakespeare you know like uh the horatio you know um something that talks about how reality is the most um crazy thing that you could dream that you could even possibly dream of yeah people that are into shakespeare know what i'm talking about but I, know, I know the quote roughly yeah but i don't i can't paraphrase it. yeah and um the, one of the reasons that i've always delved into these studies is i don't think there could be anything more fascinating than trying to understand your origins like who we are what, what we're about and that's what history is about well it's I one mean, of the greatest mysteries of about Absolutely. Time. I mean, yes, I want to understand the future. Yes, I'm obsessed with technology, but I think one of the the questions that's ingrained into our psyche, our physiology, is mm. who we are, why we're we here. And history is is the one thing that obviously is going to give us answers to that. I mean, how are you going to know where you're going if you don't know where you came from? I know that sounds all kind of like, I mean, it sounds cool. Is that any truth <laughs> it to it? It does sound pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, but I really think there is something to that. And... Yeah. I think we need to address the issue of well, it's also interesting. our past. Yeah, it's also interesting how the further forward we go, the further backwards we seem to be able to see. His, oh, I, I, were you alluding? To, are you alluding to history repeating itself? Or? No, no, I was alluding to technology giving us a bit better window into our past. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. The more, I mean, imagine if we could create a technology that could rebuild the past and mm -hmm. give us an accurate assessment of what happened. It's not that wild a concept. Considering the concepts that are being thrown around in technological circles today. Oh, you mean like time travel? Not specifically, but yes. Yeah, yeah. that's one thing I can't get my head around, man. It's it's a doozy. Yeah, I, I know there are two prevalent theories. I think we touched on this last night. Yeah. Our friend Lockie was saying, I think he made a point about how... He doesn't see how there could be two yous at the same time. Well, that, yeah, that paradox and of two... Absolutely. But it, you don't necessarily have to go into that theory. I mean, one theory behind time travel is that every time you go back in time, you're creating an alternative reality. Yeah, you so, slid into a new dimension. Yeah, and scientifically speaking, there are a lot of th theories like the multiverse um, theory that there are... I think this is... getting spoken about a lot more at the moment. I think. Yeah, but the idea that there are infinite possibilities of us like infinite versions of us in infinite realities mm. so there's a version of me right now where i'm i'm like seven foot tall and i have like a 20 inch wow i can say that man yeah. like i can actually say stuff like brother like last night man like i i performed in front of like millions of people and like all these girls are like just crazily in like in love with me man and like everyone shouted <laughs> me drinks and then you're like yeah but it, it happened man it just happened in another reality and like technically <laughs> won't be lying well yeah you'll kind of be a little bit foolish. not really not really because it, it probably according to scientific multiverse theory it happened with infinite possibilities <laughs> that should happen well i mean even without a multiverse if time is infinite then infinite possibilities will and have arisen yeah which is why i always like to argue that you're a little bit gay <laughs> no i'm just you, kidding you got that, me there too yeah, shade damn it that the, that the possibility of being, oh! being a homosexual is that yeah, look, I've I've actually changed my ways a lot. No, 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 not this, not, no, 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 no. What I meant to say by that was that. Um, well, hello, Krishna. No, sir. I, I, there was a time where I used to be really kind of like super defensive with the whole gay thing, yeah, but yeah. you know, and but, I always like to break those barriers down. No, there. yeah, absolutely. Um, no, I even even bef um, I got rid of that before I even met you, man. Like yeah, I used to be so. No, I know you're not. Yeah, but it's um, anything, but. not not ag not against gay people, but just the idea of actually thinking that you're gay you know um but you it's mean? well i would be afraid of the possibility that i may actually be gay you know also rather that by adopting certain attitudes it might turn me gay the, the possibility there was potential for me to become gay like whoa that would just that which would be is horrible what, which is what homophobia is absolutely and it's, and it's ridiculous because at the end of the day a butthole is a butthole and we all have urges um, well, I know you want to look at like that, but touche. That's but but it comes more into the fact that so so, so many societies are against it, and it's such yeah, a yeah. I mean, I see it as a social a social thing based on disease. Uh, what gay? Oh, you mean the fact that people the, the have fact, this attitude? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the attitude towards hom absolutely. homosexuality. Absolutely. Absolutely. In Uganda, I mean, it's a death penalty yeah. thing, man. You can actually get killed for uh for practicing a lot of um, Asian homosexual well. sex, man. Yeah. Does that sound hot for all the? Gay and people out there want to say that. <laughs> Homosexual sex. And see, I yeah, I put it in the same camp as why... Um, and it just sounds gay. As why I think that... Uh, who are the people that won't eat, eat pork? Yeah. Who, what's the religion? I can't remember. It, it would be uh, Muslim. H Hindu? Islam. Muslim. Muslim. Yeah. But um, there's actually rational explanations according so to my their rational as to why they do not eat that. Is because of trigonosis. 
trichinosis. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's the same same thing with in uh, the Bible is you shouldn't eat shellfish because every once in a while. 1500 years ago someone yeah. would eat a piece of fish a shellfish and they would drop dead christopher Just, ryan yeah i've heard i've heard uh, him yeah, speaking yeah. about yeah it's and how we all are as well yeah i've heard this particular podcast yeah. mentioned it's always interesting when we talk about things because we're on the same page <laughs> because we listen to the same kind of material and i put homosexuality yeah. homosexuality in the same camp um because in other cultures mm-hmm. it's celebrated for bringing people clo- ancient greek sparta yeah bringing people closer together yeah um there's yeah, there are many reasons for that. Yes, 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 this is true. But, um, yeah, I completely agree. I think the bottom line is it's more of a moral issue in the in that moral? Pe- yes, in that people have the right to do what the hell they want to do, provided oh. they are not harming anyone yeah. in the process. And if people, boyfriend first. Yeah, and if people want to be with whoever they want, provided they are consenting and yeah. of consensual age, and they're capable of making rational decisions for themselves, then what the fuck is it? What, I seldom use this, but... What the fuck concern is it of yours? Exactly. Who the hell I want to be with? Exactly. And sometimes I really wish I was gay, just so I could come out. I'm not just saying this because I've heard it before, <laughs> and I could, I could, I could de- be in defiance of people that want to. Because one of my things is being in defiance of people that are, are opposing things that are just people's rights. You and know, nothing to do with them. Yeah, like, and it's fucking fun. Yeah, when it's, it's like, who the, what, if I want to freaking have, have feces sex, if I want to have shit sex with people, if I get off by shitting on people, what concern is it of your stuff, you? I'm not <laughs> shitting on you. You should let me shit on people I want. Well, just clean your room before I come over. Yeah, it's totally we'll, we'll cool. We'll be good. We'll be good. I mean, I may think it's disgusting, but so what? Yeah. And mainly, I, I love when you can get those kind of relationships where you have friends that you completely, like, what, there's something that they do that you're just like, man, I can't see how you could enjoy that but it yeah. doesn't affect your friendship absolutely it's awesome absolutely it's a great thing yeah accepting personality to me it comes down to the idea that uh an aff- injustice anywhere is an affront to justice everywhere <laughs> i like that yeah and look you're gonna um, and you have a look at history you have a look at situations where you know figures like let's say we always like to use hitler they they start attacking the minorities and because it's not affecting you directly you're like oh let hitler you know have a go at the blacks who cares <laughs> let hitler have a go at the, the the poles who cares about that you know and then it eventually comes down to you and because you've taken on this attitude of not caring because it's not directly affecting you mm. well no one's going to come to your defense i mean as soon as you see people attacking uh people that are not that are doing what the hell they want they're not harming anyone in the process i mean that's attacking your inalienable rights and that's when you have to stand up against that stuff which is why you can't be a bystander because even by standing by you are affected i mean mm. those people that go it's no, interesting it, it did you do that on purpose by standing by standing by, by? no i didn't i, I didn't. love it that just, you have i started um, to, I'll, I'll let you go on i was going to talk about how i've started breaking the words up it's called green language yeah. they give you clues into what words actually mean by standing by bystander oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah nice yeah the lot of them yeah yeah um that as a bystander you mm. may think you're not affected, but you're affected. Yeah. Even, it's I mean, it, evil it goes, when become really, I'm jumping back into, into one matter. of my favorite topics mm-hmm. ever these days, which is morphic resonance. And that yeah. simply by the incident of Hitler killing a bunch of people or whatever terrible injustice you'd it's like to It's become more accepted. Well, or it, it affects everything. Everything. Affects Absolutely. Everything. We all tap into the uh, collective unconscious. What you call morphic resonance, the reason I love it so much is that Rupert Sheldrake, being a huge fan of the Eastern schools of thoughts, hmm. Hinduism, all that kind of stuff, he took on an already relatively established idea, but not within the scientific paradigms, no. and elaborated on that. Because what we refer to as the collective unconscious or morphic resonance is present in the Hindu culture under the Akashic Records, hmm. which talks about how there's basically a library of information, this in the ether that we all tap into. Yeah. And when you're in these, these uh, transcended states, you can tap into certain information about anything that has ever happened, and it's supposed to explain phenomena like past life. Um, be, you know, in hypnosis, how people are able to uh, gain access to their past lives and things like that. All the, a lot of metaphysical phenomena that doesn't seem legit is explained within the realm of morphic resonance or the Akashic records. Absolutely, and uh, and shamans of the Amazon talk about it all the time. With when they drink ayahuasca, they experience. Um, Sp- Spirit of Mother Gaia or the something like that. The information presented to them by the collective mind. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love how morphic, I mean, morphic resonance is not a, not a new concept, but it's definitely 
making that idea very accessible to science. Yeah, it's a new school, new school science. I like that. I think yeah. I just coined that word, even though I probably didn't. New school science. New school science. I like that. That's uh, that's what it's bringing into this world, man. We need to find a synthesis between this materialistic mindset mm. and uh, spirituality, and obviously quantum mechanics is doing that. And I think it's it's coming, and a lot of I mean, you can talk about how people are waking up, or or mm. there's a big uh, big yoga movement in the air, or what have you. Yeah. But I think I, I think we're that. getting closer to finding that balance between materialism and and, yeah. and uh, spirituality. Right now, we the perfect example of that is Confess. It's going on right now. I was um, thinking of going to that. So was I. Karan was, Karan was trying to sell it to me by telling me, Karan's this crazy friend we have <laughs> and he, oh, you know, he's the perfect salesman. He knows how to get at you, to get you to you know, subscribe true. to something. He's that like, oh, you're going to be lots of like hippie girls there, Krishna. You know yeah. what that means. So you didn't talk about the girls with me. He knew that I'm, uh, I yeah. know where to find girls. But that, that wouldn't have much pull for you? Oh, wait, you already, you got so many girls waiting for you, man. You don't need to get girls. That. <laughs> not that, not that. But, um, yeah. No, I mean, uh, no, I was excited about the hippies jamming, playing their guitars, beating on the drums. So use that angle for you. in the woods. Absolutely. But then he disappeared without letting me know when they were going. That's so. crying for you. Uh, but I, I feel as if people within that world, they, he was telling me that, that they all have this hippie attitude. According mm. to Quran, that basically means, and by the way, I don't trust anything that comes out of Quran's mouth. Apparently <laughs> it means being happy. Like a huge part of being hippie like, is related to the happiness state. The fact that hippies, they do always have this positive vibe about them. Mm. And it's like being in this state of, I would imagine, obviously not having tried these drugs, I can't vouch for it, but I'm guessing you may be able to, uh, not that you would have tried these drugs, of course, because you would never do anything <laughs> like that. But um, what are those happy pills called? Which one's ecstasy? Ecstasy, yeah. It's Which like is MDMA. Yeah, MDMA. It's kind of like being in a state of ecstasy. Yeah. Um, when you are in these hippie confess circles. Well, I'd say uh, after having a transcendental experience, or after after having an experience where you feel like you've touched the palm of God, or whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. and you're completely sober after that, you feel like ecstasy times a hundred. It's Absolutely. like that that hippie pleasure of being connected to things is yeah. one of the apparently greatest pleasures you can feel that's why they're called entheogens i mean these drugs yeah, they yeah. they're derived from to have god within you and not that you're obviously having some kind of thought or maybe hey i just had a thought here it's gonna go really really inappropriate yeah but i just had a thought Tell check me. this out i was gonna say it's kind of like having god within you like it was <laughs> in me right but maybe just maybe yeah sex like the the state of um that euphoria like yeah. Or that orgasmic state is thing. is more or less the same scene, and so yeah, it's all, yeah. almost as if we we're talked all, about this last night. We right? did. We're all striving for that that extreme state of a euphoria that you experience, you know. And well, it's like this idea whether it's that, religious I mean, experience it, or it's, sex, man. It's all the same. Looking at a beautiful piece of art, having a mind blowing orgasm, being on four tabs of LSD, it's having or, God or meditating you. and starving yourself for forty days, forty nights in the desert. It's all leading to the same touch of source, touching the palm of God, yeah. kind of. I mean, as many woo-woo terms as you want to put on it, we don't have anything that can yeah. be culturally kind of, oh, yeah, that's what that is. Yeah, but it's but, interesting, and it might be what we're all trying yeah. to uh, to attain, but we're, we're obviously doing it under limited capacities, whether it's absolutely, uh, absolutely. search for fame and stardom, which yeah. I'm like, hey, man, I want to be famous! And so, I mean, and I was thinking about just, this... Because I'm not loved, I want to experience love with God. Nice. I was uh, no, no, no. That was uh, yeah. like, that's a powerful thing to say because mm -hmm. I was thinking about this last night and how drug addiction. I mean, Gabo Mate or Mate or however you say his name. I'm not sure. I don't know about it. Says that uh, addiction is is simply the avoidance of pain. Everyone that is a substance abuser is trying to mask their pain, and. I thought, well, that seems fairly accurate through the, my experiences with people who suffer a lot. Mm -hmm. The other thing that seems to be an idea is that all drug addicts are seeking a high that the drug can't get them to. Yeah. And that they're seeking this touch with source or with, with the creative drive within them. And they're stuck in a pattern of trying to get there and diminishing the effects of whatever they're having. And it's, it's interesting. It's interesting how, no, it's powerful, how the, the more you try and reach for that, yeah, the less the less you can get it. Absolutely, maybe because one way of you achieving it is uh, is obviously done letting go. No, I'm saying that the approach of using drugs to attain that is uh, may not be the best way, and each time you're striving for it, that way you're losing something. And yeah, see, uh, see, I 
I don't know. Like, I don't like the whole the whole concept of you have to obtain it on the natch. Yeah. Because there is no natural. I mean, if you have that's a good point. Everything you put in your body affects your physiology. That's true. Whether it be an illegal substance or celery. Absolutely. Uh, oh, I've started swearing a lot lately, man. I'm trying to be all just <laughs> I'm, I'm the same. Um, it's kind of it adds character. I'm like trying to trying to have bring some bad attitude but back. But I think you gotta I think you gotta pepper it out because you want to use those fucks. To when emphasize what yeah. you're saying, and if and you I was say fuck that. in every sentence, yeah. you lose it. But the point you made was absolutely valid, fucking and I was trying to, yeah, that was a fucking good point, man. <laughs> wow, look at you, making me a bad boy. But, but yeah, w one of the concepts that I've assimilated lately, I love using big words, uh, is that there is no distinction between drugs and foods. No. I mean, at the end of the day, they're all affecting ourselves in a particular way changing our physiology and Absolutely. Uh, I think the best way to medicate yourself is to be to be careful what you take into yourself so I was talking to somebody the other day about mm -hmm. how uh, your friend Dan um, Dan 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 uh, big hair oh yeah Dan yeah we got to get him on guy. here he's a great cool guy. dude um, Yo, shout out to Dan if you ever get around <laughs> watching this uh, I was I'm gonna get him on here one of these days Dan about how I was seeing this thing on the Rogan podcast a little while ago about mm -hmm. how your gut bacteria creates cravings for food that you think you want and yes. so you are not controlling those thoughts your Absolutely. stomach bacteria is we're a colony my friend and uh it's funny because we think so many of our thoughts are our own but they're actually created by other organisms within us as well as, as you know, organisms without us as above so below yeah powerful man i like how you're bringing back the uh homeless just from just shit there that. yeah um but apparently one third of the uh the organisms within our gut or even within our body. Oh, that's right. Check this out. Check this out. I, don't, stuff me on the yeah. Stuff me on the. I'm gonna stuff up the actual statistics. But yeah, I'm just gonna say one third of the uh, the cells within our body aren't even our own. Mm. That sounds crazy, right? Too much cannibalism, huh? Uh, how does that work? Because remember how I was saying how you were telling me about yeah. how people that succumb to uh, cannibalism go insane. Yeah. Because of all the DNA that they're eating that isn't their own affects their mental state. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a way we're theory. Yeah, I'm, I'm seeing how that relates to um, the, uh, this thing. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't, Doesn't matter. matter. But yeah, that's a crazy topic. Topic of cannibalism, <laughs> man. Let's drop. Let's drop into that a bit, because um, I know this is a topic that's really touchy. Yeah. But I I heard a would you a eat report. a person? Sorry. Would you eat a person? No, brother. I I don't even eat animals, man. You know oh, how, you yeah. know how I'm like on yeah. this. There's no chance in hell I'm going to eat a person. But I will tell you this. Would you eat an animal? Sorry. Would you? Eat no one. But check this you out, brother. I'm going to I'm going to throw this in your face. You ready for it? No. Not just you. Everyone else. Well, you, <laughs> brace yourself, man. Most people, if they were eating a freaking human being, let's right, eating um a human be being, they would not be able to tell the freaking difference between pork, man. Yeah. 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 It's a, that's why it's called lung pig because pork pig pig flesh it tastes very similar to uh according to uh so many of the accounts yeah that's very what human they say. That's a very, and it, um... yeah in north korea like i told you about the incident a while back about how as you know north koreans very poor they don't have much food and the government tried packaging human flesh at some point as pork and for a long time the people were not aware of the fact that they were eating human flesh mm -hmm. they just said it tasted like pork and they once of course they caught on to and they were enraged but so they're not eating the flesh now that they know it's human um, yeah, but it, okay. it's just an incident that happened. I don't know. I don't know to what capacity that hap happened, Doesn't but matter. apparently it happened. And it's just scary to think that most people could not tell the difference between a piece of pork on the steak and human flesh. Yeah. And a lot of cannibal cultures they refer to uh, humans as long pig because mm. you can't tell the. And you think about it, pigs are so very similar to human beings. I was about to bring yeah, that I mean, up. There's a reason we can change. We can interchange certain parts of their bodies to human yeah, parts of uh, bodies. Human uh, hearts for pig hearts and things like that. As yeah. well as, uh, you know what's one of my favorite things about how pigs are like humans? How? That pigs are adaptable. If you put a human in any environment, yeah. if they've got the will, they will they will adapt to their environment. Yeah. It's the same with a pig. If you take a pig from a farm... And you put it a into cute a... cute little pig, yeah. fluffy little pig, and you put it in the bush, come back a couple of years later, and it'll be a goddamn bull. That scares... I don't know about you, man, but that scares the hell out of me. Why? Think, because, um, well, the idea... Of eating something like that. I mean, look, I, once again, I know this is a sensitive topic, but the idea of me eating something like that, that is a clearly relatively intelligent. I mean, let's be real <laughs> over here. These things are intelligent, yeah, and yeah, yeah. they're not that far away from the taste Why of human are beings. They intelligent, though? 
they're intelligent because of the fact that they hide, the fact that they 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 employ so there are certain. Pla- there are plants that hide. Sorry. There are plants that hide. Okay. Okay. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> um, pigs, without a doubt, their yeah. their fear that they express the they're more we we can yeah we can relate the uh, the emotions that they have to us more so that we can plants and absolutely. Where is which I, is why we don't consider plants to be intelligent beings. That's true. Time. We still absolutely consider plants to be alive. Yes, they adapt to their environment. And yet they the li- don't hold any standard of merit when it comes to something with eyes. Yes. We don't collectively, though, attribute the characteristics that a plant has to the, our characteristics absolutely. as much as we do to animals. Absolutely. Animals, as you know, they they have emotions that we... If anyone has a dog... People know they go through moods. Yep. People know they feel they feel lonely, and uh, more to the point, they have a f- plants don't have a central nervous system. They don't have a, a heart. They don't have a, a. So we can't relate to them. So we find it very easy to eat them. No, well, the the, the main point is their ability to actually experience pain. I mean, the whole idea of pain is uh, is related to the central nervous system. You able to interpret it. It's not. It's, so we don't know that plants can't feel pain. We just know in our def in how we know that pain is able to be experienced and that's through nerves and senses yeah you make you make a point there we can't we can't argue it 100 percent from a from a scientific standpoint no, but and so the, my... but i would say that based on the science that we're aware of the idea that um sentience the whole idea of sentience sentience which is not another way of saying it dropping knowledge yo is that you do have a central nervous system that is connected to a heart that is connected to a brain mm. that is that's one way of us defining sentience and because we don't see that within plants we don't refer to them yes they have a level of awareness yes they have a level of experience they're alive but it's not that which is akin to that of an animal you don't eat fish either do you no i do not okay. it comes down to the fact that whereas you can argue everything has consciousness stones yeah. have consciousness the air has conscious and I know how crazy it sounds but everything Not if we have a look at the fundamental building blocks of everything if we have a look at on if we have a look at this in a microscopic level it's you can't space. tell the difference yeah. however there are certain things that have more consciousness than other there are others their ability to feel the ability to understand it seems more uh, it, it seems greater yeah. and I would make the argument that the thing, if something has a level of consciousness that, that is, is similar to your own, well, not necessarily similar to our own, but is of a level that is too much. I don't want to freaking harm it because it is a uh, feeling. It, yeah, it's feeling. Like if something is completely unaware, it doesn't experience what we would define as pain in our concept of how we define pain. Yeah, it's like if a freaking. I'm pretty sure that if I hit a stone. It's it's not even individuated. It's consciousness. Like particularly trees. I mean, if you pull a a, a fruit from a freaking tree, it's you're you're not. It grows back again. It's all of its consciousness is not located within that fruit. Mm. It's spread across throughout the entire tree. I think for a stone and a lot of other minerals, it's See, not likened it's, to. I don't think it's just spread across the tree. I think it's more of a. Uh, spread across the planet kind of situation like yeah, but when, when you start talking about nature. That's true, but um, I'm making the distinct distinction between animals okay. and well, animals, human beings, which are a part of animals and plants and minerals. And the, A human being's consciousness, I would say, is more individuated. A human being's capacity to feel pain is more visceral, it's tangible, it's palpable. And uh, when people make the whole argument that plants and animals are the same, well, they're not really. There's similarities there. So what if we're looking from a standpoint of the animal feeling no pain? Um, yeah, Ethical hunting. Ethical hunting. Um, the animal would die anyway. Yeah. That's um, from, the, from the point of the animal feeling no pain, fair enough. In because most cases, I would defer to the fact that that was most likely the case in hunting. The only, I mean, the only thing about vegetarianism and veganism that appeals to me is mm-hmm. st- standing against factory farming and, and yeah. our, the way we get our food. But I'd much more like to go down the route of ethical hunting yeah. I've heard you than bring this not eating out. meat. I understand that, and whereas I think it's more ethical in that you do not want these animals to experience more pain, it comes down to the fact that sentient beings have a right to life. Just like if I made the argument that if I went and ended someone's life harmlessly, effectively, like an actual human being, and I was, I was like, well, it, it felt no pain. I mean, it didn't feel anything. I just shot it. It just died. Was the human going to live forever? Uh, obviously not. The point, I so would... So doesn't the sentient being also have a right to death? 
sentient being yes but my point is that most people would use the argument that the sentient being had a right to life it had a right to experience it had ambitions and that hopes is, that and is the general general vegan argument absolutely and ultimately it comes down to wanting to minimize the pain mm. and the harm that you're causing on this world and absolutely. i believe it's inescapable you can make the argument that life eats life on some way or another but ultimately when you have a choice to minimize that pain mm. It, I think, from a moral, from a more, from a more moral standpoint, you should lean towards the option that is um, reducing the pain. Absolutely, and I like the Native American or Aboriginal way of doing things of only taking mm -hmm. what you need, having immense respect for what you take and what yeah. you leave, absolutely, and, uh, having that relationship with what you kill. Absolutely, um, I ha you have no argument in in a yeah, situation. Yeah, no, I don't think we're not at, at a opposed position. Not at all. In a situation where there's no alternative, like a lot of people talk about evolutionary theory about ice age, ice ages. In a situation where there's basically no vegetation around, mm. uh, there are no animals around. You have to eat each other. I mean, I'd rather kill myself. Don't get me wrong, but so, it makes so. In a position where you'd have to go cannibal or death, you'd go death. Um. Yes. It's good to know. Yeah, yeah. It's well, that, that's just me. I tend to have a very different outlook if from most people. If we get stranded, I'm going to eat, brother. Yeah, you're probably going to eat me, man. <laughs> um, but don't blame me, brother. You well, good. When I give you Matt, CJD, oh, which shit, is the no Crossrail's Jacob's disease, which is the human version of mad cow disease, well, by the I'm way. I'm stranded. I don't mind Yeah, crazy. it's like Mother Nature bores certain things. That's my theory, my opinion. But yeah. the point is that in a situation like that, yeah, by all means, if there is no other alternative, fair enough eat those animals around but I would make the argument in a situation where you don't actually need to in a situation where you have um, in my opinion viable alternatives which are arguably in my opinion better it just seems like it's uh, a less moral stance to take have you always been a vegan? no brother I've always been vegetarian though I hit the eight. well not always I'll be, you, yeah, how when long? I was around the age of 7, 8 okay. that's when I started started doing series around was, the age of 10 was there something that prompted? Oh. Absolutely. Once I hit the age of reason, I would call it, when I actually started thinking for myself, I have my earliest memories of fucking loving animals. Yeah. Like, I would see Benji, the movie, I would cry. I was like, and most kids feel like this, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You show kids farm animals and they go freaking. And I love the fact that most people feel that way. Absolutely. All right. And then I made the connection once I started realizing that, wait a sec, I'm eating this thing that I love. And I didn't even understand about factory farming then, but it just occurred to me that, wait a sec, there was a massive connection here that these things were dying. Yeah. And somewhere along the lines, I realized, oh, they're di dying so I can eat them. Once that realization took place around, uh, no solidified, more, no yeah, more. I was like, oh, fucking you. Because most people, I truly believe, and you may disagree with me as much as you want, I believe that most people do not fully understand the extent of what factory farming is like. I don't disagree they, with you. They fall into this idea that there are these practices like halal, halal meat or you know, how they get stunned. And there's but no, it's very... It doesn't necessarily reduce the suffering of the animal. Yeah, but for the most part, I would encourage people to watch a documentary called Earthlings. And I, I put this as a challenge to any of my friends that watch this video. I would pay you, only my friends, because I know I can trust them and that they would be honest in watching this video. It's hard to I would I would pay them $20 to watch that entire documentary from start to finish only to watch. only because it gives people an appreciation of where the food is coming from Absolutely. and i believe once people are aware of that secretively i believe that they will probably change their diet or at worst give them a, a greater appreciation for it and in the minority make people just not give a crap at all but i think most people would actually give a give a crap absolutely absolutely yeah, and no, it's a very hard document yeah. to watch right? and the whole thing about consciousness i think is learning more like you were you were you were evolving to higher states of awareness and there is this quote i often like to quote though to know and not do is not to know the idea of not changing yourself in accordance to the knowledge that you've accumulated is really not to know because once you fully you're fully aware mm. the idea of continuing to do certain things I think it's like, it's not real consciousness. That's why I make the argument that most people are fully aware of certain things. It becomes incumbent upon them to, to change their attitudes. Yeah. Like, obviously with you, you, you went to the, you, you started thinking about hunting ethically when you became aware of factory farming, I would, I would think, right? I was aware of factory farming long before then, but when I made a moral choice to be, to be trying to minimize my harm on the world. Yeah. And then I started looking into factory farming Fair enough. and ethical hunting much more. W um, okay. But I just wanted to go back for a second. Um, in terms of your experience as a child of mm. seeing animals and, and then having that realization that that's what's on the plate, 
is the exact same thing happened with my mum when she was about nine or, or okay. eight, eight years old and she was running around a farm in, in, mm-hmm. in Cape Town or in Zimbabwe or somewhere and and there were these all these little chickens bark, 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 walking around yeah. her and then she looked up and there was the meat on the grill right there and she she made that connection of this is this yeah and she went no Wow, you, no. your, your mom? How long did she do that for? She was like seven or eight. And for the next 20 to 25 years of her life, she was vegan and vegetarian. Wow. What brought her back? The fact that her body was getting destroyed. Was she doing... I would always argue whenever I hear, hear this, how was she doing it? Was she eating lots of fruits, vegetables, having a spectrum back of different then, stuff? Yeah. the knowledge of how to be a healthy, veg- healthy vegan wasn't there. Absolutely. And so, and she was a ballet dancer as well. And so right. there was great pressure on uh, health or, or uh, the look of your body and, and those kind of things. And so... That's a valid um, point. The whole, the whole lack of iron and lack of education in South Africa during the 80s and 90s in terms mm. of healthy eating and things like that. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't a viable option. But it's starting to become one much, much more. Absolutely. There's a documentary called, uh, what's it called? What's it called? Cowspiracy. I just watched it a while yeah, ago that addresses, saw, saw that. addresses this. And it, uh, I mean, look, we're in the 21st century now. I mean, there are so many mock products out there that it's ridiculous. And I know people hate the, the, t- the taste of this stuff, but... Well, like tofu and stuff? Well, yeah, tofu is very bland. But here's yeah, the thing. Here's the thing about... And you look, know what I'd go for if what? I'm a vegetarian? You know what? what my main replacement for meat would be? What? Mushrooms. Yeah, that's another good one. But let me I ask you this. I love big mushrooms. Alex? They're delicious. But mushrooms are almost sentient. Um, you, you have a good point there. I know you want to delve into this no, because they no, are, yeah, no, they no, act, the way they act into... I, I'm familiar with that. I'm familiar with that. Um, I just like mushrooms. But I would make the argument that if most people had to eat meat raw, completely raw, mm. they would not like the taste of it. No. Yeah, I've, I've eaten, is, eaten, yeah. I have not. Actually, yes, I have. I would have at some like point, yeah. Beef, beef tartar. Deeper. It's yeah. fucking disgusting. Well, think about tofu roll. Once you season tofu with all this yummy seasoning, you get a one of those gourmet sh- chefs to add all of this amazingly yummy stuff with it. It'll be one of it. the most delicious sponges you've ever tasted. Absolutely. <laughs> but it's yeah. still a fucking sponge. Yeah, but it still has lots of yeah. nu- no. nutrients that are good for you. I'm not a big fan of the texture, which is why I go for yeah. mushrooms instead. And I get but that. I mean, relatively average texture compared to suffering for thousands of animals I, I can see your point a little bit I'm glad you bring that up because one thing I've noticed like I became vegan initially because of health reasons it wasn't later on until I saw the connection we don't need to go into that but a lot of vegans argue that a uh, vegetarian diet has many flaws because ethically you're still facilitating these industries that are still slaughtering all these animals and whatnot the whole idea is that in veganism you were tremendously reducing the uh, the pain that you cause mm-hmm. and um, from my argument, when I went vegan, I was still in the mindset that under a vegetarian diet, you could still avoid um, a tr- all the all the harm. Like by having eggs at the end of the day, it's just the chickens' periods, you know. Mm-hmm. And provided it's uh, you you have these chickens yourself, you're taking good care of it. Blah 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 blah. You're not harming it. As far as mu- milk, even if you wanted to extract the milk from a, a cow that you you happen to be friends with, it's like, hey cow, can I have your milk? <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's not an ethical. Um, the main reason for me becoming a vegan was for health reasons. However, most people that become vegan for health reasons do not that last. Not necessarily because health reasons. Health reasons. Be, they're doing it purely motivated to be, get skinny. Yeah, to become leaner. They feel as if because um, that's not health. That's vanity reasons. Oh uh, well, true. But there, look. Once again, it is contentious issue. There are a lot of arguments to may, be made that it is actually a healthier diet. Fair enough. So there yeah. are some people that are doing it to be healthy. Oh, absolutely. Mistake, mistake. I mean, just let me drop some facts. And according to the greatest, largest uh, study ever done, the China study, uh, if you are a meat eater there is a 51.5% chance at some point in your life you will have either a heart attack, some cardiovascular illness, yeah. or a stroke, as opposed to 15% of vegetarian type, just based on statistics well, then over you, a larger scale. Then you scale. have to start asking questions about how much meat is being eaten, yada, yeah. yada, yada. Yeah, absolutely. Because, I mean... Uh, and that's the counter-argument, yeah. You know, my, my big thing is, mm. is balance. And Yes. And so I think that you shouldn't eat too much red meat. The same argument could be made, though, for smoking cigarettes or for taking um, s- uh, certain substances, that if you're taking too much, obviously you'll, ob- you'll overdose, but if you don't, you probably won't. But the point being made is that there's still, there's still something about these substances or this uh, material, I have a question over here, mm. that is not doing something good to your uh, arteries or whatever. See, and there's a lot of science see, behind it. My, my argument to mm. that is that 
shamans and, and spiritual cultures use tobacco to ward off evil spirits. Yes. And that so and that marijuana can be used to have spiritual experiences. Fair and enough. so that while these things may not be good for your health in, in excessive or even fairly regular use, yeah. that there can be practical and positive application. Um, I would somewhat agree with that. I would. I think in the right doses, it's a very nuanced argument. Purely on a health level, yeah, there are people who live well above into their hundreds. Yeah, on that on that diet, absolutely. My point, though, is oh man, I kind of lost my, my chain of thought over here. Um, yeah, statistically speaking, if you actually have a look at across the board, just the sheer numbers game, the mm. fact that um, as opposed to vegans, um, like the amount, of, I think it's five percent of vegans having cardiovascular illnesses. It's 5% as opposed to 51.5%. A lot of people decide to take on this desi this diet. Also, you have a look at how it actually s seems to cause certain cancers. Um, colon cancer is actually related to the consumption of meat. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And various other cancers as well. But the point is that um, a lot of people take on these diets for health reasons, right? Yeah. I don't think people will really last if they're doing it for those reasons. You think because it has to be a moral reason? Um. I, I have to be very specific standpoint. about my words over here because where I think a lot of people do last making that change, I think when it comes to motivation for selfish reasons, and yeah, doing it for yourself is a great thing, but it still is a selfish thing that you're doing it for. Most of the people that last um, make these changes because they are concerned about the welfare of other. When you're doing things for your for other people, mm. it becomes to it turns out to be a lot stickier. Yeah, and I made the change to veganism, but I was kind of like not wholeheartedly into it kind of like I wasn't strict if there was like milk in a biscuit or something like that I wasn't strict with it until I made the connection more on a moral level and then I was like oh shit oh really yeah I kind of see that you know what um yeah I'm gonna be more st but that would, about that's this. what yeah. works for you I mean it goes both ways because mm -hmm. some sometimes when people do things for other people it doesn't stick at all and they need to when they realize, no, I'm actually quitting cigarettes because it's what I want and not what mum and dad and, and right. all my friends want me to do is when it will stick. I think it's, it's very, uh, it depends on the person. You make a good point there. Would you agree, though, that... Uh... But it depends how we, how we define it as, as selfish, really. I mean, what is yeah. it? It's, it's a very situational situation. Have a look at maternal instincts. Have a look at... Uh, one thing I've, I've learned is that when... <laughs> Textualize that. Okay, form. when a mother is defending her young, the the emotional uh, ch charged nature of her entire physiology, her being, her essence, so is old... so much more so than when she is striving for something for herself. Yeah. People, one of the, the arguments that I have heard for having children is the old that mum lifts a car up to save her baby. Kind yeah, of thing. Absolutely. absolutely, absolutely. When you're doing things for the people you love, yeah, you gain an enormous amount of strength. Yeah, and you see how people act just around defending their young. Like I've heard the the irrational arguments parents make, and I'm sorry, I'm saying the irrational for wanting to defend their children under any circumstance, uh, circumstance whatsoever. You're not a it's parent, just, you couldn't understand exactly. the rational. Some, yeah, concept. sometimes it's just like so. Okay, if you're if your son is beating me up and I punch him in the face, you'll come over and you'll you'll do some crazy stuff to me. Not that I've heard a parent make this argument, but well, I feel yeah. I mean, that's a. I think that's a bit of an, a situation. Like, I, really, you got to like, yeah. I mean, I have heard I, a lot of parents make the statement though that if yeah. anyone ever touched their kids, they would beat the shit out of them, yeah. under, regardless of what the situation was. And I'm like, be, like, kill them, murder them. And you know what I say that is what. I see that as as the kind of that monkey mind defensive urge. It comes yeah. comes to comes forward, and then it's pure impulse. You're no longer in control of your actions. Yeah, you're you're being in a bit of a dip. That's true. <laughs> because really, the right, right thing to do is come over, hit you in the face, goddamn ha hard, scoop up your child, and get the hell out of there. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, most people are. Uh are relying on that reptilian brain when they're acting in that yeah, well, maternal I, instinct. I think it comes from this this thing of neutralizing the threat, mm -hmm. making sure that it can't come back and hurt the child again. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I don't actually want to have children. This idea that I feel like there'd be such a shift in a consciousness, not necessarily for the better, yeah. mind you, that I would become biologically insane in certain aspects, like the <laughs> just the the level at which you're willing to protect Aren't you your biologically young? insane in oh, certain to, aspects already. Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. When but women come into the picture, that, we become yeah, pretty exactly. Biologically that's insane. yeah, that's that's bad enough, man. I don't yeah. need to have another element brought to the equation there, and. Uh,
Yeah, it, it does scare me, man. Um, would you? Uh, well, it's it's an interesting concept because on one hand, it's like, would you would you fight for your life? And if you'd fight for your life, then of course you'd fight for your child's life. Oh, absolutely. Because your child is is simply a uh, a continuation of self. Yeah, that's one sense. way of looking at it. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. True. that's true. Um, Whereas I think that's completely justified and that's moral. But it becomes a, an issue when you're fighting for your your child's life upon at the expense of something a, yeah at, a, at the expense of which is where else. which is where it becomes an interesting conversation as as you were mm. saying you would rather take your own life than take someone else's and be a cannibal and it's the same thing can can come when talking about at what cost do you protect yourself or your children and yeah at and the cost of others that's when it becomes can, an issue i can see yeah that your issue with having children of of it takes away from agape, which is the whole idea of universal love. Like, I'm going to focus only that on... That said, as, yeah. as a hippie, I, I don't know if that's the... I mean, well, as it you may, being yeah, a it may, it may enhance it. And if it does, yeah. fantastic. But I feel what it does. It and I, I hear closer to the world. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people, a lot of families, they speak about the family as if it's the only thing that is of extreme importance. And it's like all that matters is the family unit. Mm. Agape is when you extend the family unit towards... The universe. The universe. Yeah. And I see, while you have a bit of a problem with the family unit, mm -hmm. I have a problem with nationalism. So do I. I have a massive problem with nationalism. Yeah. Because... I have a form of all forms of discrimination. Was, what was that word That's my used? thing. Sorry? Well, no, no, no. Nationalism, I don't refer to that as discrimination. It is. By definition, your nation is the most important. You don't care about other nations. Yeah, I see, I see your point. Yeah. Really, I just mean the, the taking pride in your nation as a, I see what you as mean. a separate entity. I see um, what you mean. Which is, I mean, that's the same thing as the yeah, family. Still, thing. It's yeah. taking pride in, Absolutely. in this unit above this unit. Yeah, and it's what creates but, all this, this division between people. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd say we do it. It first starts with speciesism, and I know it's a sensitive topic, but Absolutely. we always say, "Oh, this is it's is only a pig. It doesn't have any feelings. Uh, I'll just do what the hell I want to it." Yeah. Oh, hey, this this person's black. Oh shit, these people don't have feelings. I'll just do what the hell I want with it. Yeah. I'll switch. The one thing that allowed apparently. Uh, Before we go to right. what was that word you used what? to describe that that love agape. of it? agape 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 it's agape. a it's a it's a Greek word. It's uh, like one by Plato, I think. It sounds very tribal. Agape agape a -a agape. Yeah. Yeah, I like it, man. Um, uh, you were saying about Auschwitz. Yeah, I mean, one of the analogies that I've heard that seems completely insane um, initially, then you go, oh, shit, that's actually ridiculously uh, salient, as my friend Robert Foster would say. Uh, love drop, you know, name drop in there. Uh, Robert Foster is this guy that does this channel called Rap News, and I started using really big words because of him. Nice. One of the words he uses is salient. Like, um, yeah, it's a really precise, clever uh, way of expressing something. And one of the concepts was around how in Auschwitz, basically the 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 Nazis they looked at the Jews as being lesser people. They weren't normal humans. That's what allowed them to do a lot of the atrocities on them. It's like, yeah, we wouldn't treat normal good people like this. It's horrible. Citizens. Yeah, but these are they're just they're not the second rate citizens. Mm. So obviously all this terrible stuff that we're doing to them is acceptable. Now I heard a guy by the name of Gary Urofsky. Now he's a proponent for veganism, and it's, he's a very controversial guy. But he made the point that the whole situation with um, you know animal cruelty is akin to outswitch because we look at these animals, even though uh, it's, I mean they're they're animals. At the end of the day, so, let, let let me rephrase that. He's making the comparison by saying that yes, we look at these animals as being lesser lesser beings, and we're obviously allowing. Um, the, the worst atrocities to be perpetrated on these animals, and it's just like the situation in Auschwitz, and and so it's, yeah, it, it, it just seems like such a a strong point to me because everything, as far as the way they treated the, the mass murdered, I mean, we have over 150 billion animals slaughtered every year. Man. Yeah, it, and to me, it comes back to a very simple point of mm -hmm. the the more distinction you have between I and other, the mm -hmm. easier it is to fall into that trap. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. It to me, it's a very touchy topic. You know, the whole situation of I think discrimination. We've, we've yeah. been on a lot of controversial topics. Oh, today. we have. But uh, that's fun. what I admire the most about you, man. You, no matter what, you maintain your your Jedi flow state, regardless. <laughs> you know. Whereas if I made that comparison to a Jew, I thought uh, I was more uh, of a WWE wrestler than a Jedi. Oh, no, you'd be, but... no, no way. That's crazy, man. Animals are not the same thing. Oh, I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna whip your ass. 
with your ass, that's kind of gay. <laughs> well, not necessarily. But, uh, if you were getting your ass ripped, it would oh, be gay. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. But, yeah. but um, now, one of the things I love about you, both you and Sonny, which I do this a lot with, is we're, we're unbelievably blunt with each other. Mm. Sonny makes the most uh, cogent arguments and calls me like, um, like I know it's it's not from a place of anger. Like yeah. we get very very into each other when we have arguments on every topic, yeah. you know. And uh, it's never from a bad place, but it allows us to be real with each other. A lot of the times, there's all this pandering back and forth when you're speaking to people. Like, oh, I got to be politically correct. Yeah. I might offend them, and it takes away from the realness of the conversation. Absolutely, because I mean, you've even gotten me in a couple of points in this conversation where I've had to go holy shit, think about what you're saying or very soon you're going to be going, no, I'm just talking shit and it doesn't make sense. You make me make sure my arguments are valid, which is why these kind of conversations work. Absolutely. Like the one thing I, I found, I heard this from a guy... Well, not necessarily valid, but grounded. Yeah. Grounded in um, logic. If you're both open to reason and logic and you're going to be... You're not going to have confirmation bias. What happens when you argue is that... Don't we all have confirmation bias? We do. To an but extent. You try to minimize it, that yeah, as much as you absolutely, can. Absolutely. Yeah. You both speak reason and logic, and you speak this openly until one of you sees the errors of your, of your ways. And <laughs> ultimately, if you're both being honest about what you're talking about, eventually you're going to merge into union in your thoughts and the way that you see things to the point where you don't have any disagreements. And this often happens with relationships with people. I mean, if when they continually argue, it's not because they like arguing. It's because w there, is flaw there is a flawed reasoning in someone's logic. And it reaches the point where one person has to give up because they realize the idiocy of their arguments until... Or the friendship will break. Or the yeah. relationship but will But if break. you were open and you were, you were devoid of ego enough, yeah, you real one of you obviously has to see what... Um, the fault is in your argument and obviously you assimilate that other person's argument and that's that's beautiful to me so the whole point of having the whole point of of two people arguing constantly is trying to reach an equilibrium yes and to try to grow in consciousness mm. and if you're open enough um, you get rid of your ego that's what happens man you people open you up to different ways of seeing things and you it's see incredibly hard to, it is to push your ego aside it is and I will be honest to, and, and say that there are certain issues like for instance the whole morality argument yeah. I will not push <clears throat> my confirmation bias aside because the alternative is to accept that there is no right and wrong and all, everything is permissible and to be honest intuitively I just don't feel that but there are situations where I do have confirmation bias but I'm open about those situations well I you gotta you gotta respect someone that'll follow their intuition and their their felt beliefs more than anything Mm -hmm. rather than someone else's convincing argument yeah and that's the problem like we'll just I just want to bring this up because we kind of alluded to this earlier when we started talking about how I find that one of the the issues with uh, with knowledge in this world is that people more often than not just go with the status quo rather than trying to use their own intuition mm -hmm. discern what is right and what is wrong yeah I mean, if we are truly creations of God, obviously God has endowed us with certain ability, our, our logic to discern false from um, truth. Mm. And I think if you rely on that, as opposed to saying, oh, so many and so people support something, therefore it must be true. Like, you're familiar with the phenomenon of the Milgram experiment? The whole idea about how they, a whole bunch of scientists... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that yeah. the one with the uh, electric shocks? Absolutely. And um, yeah. they're, they're turning up the shocks based on... Uh, someone telling them to, yeah. and they get to the point where they actually think the person is collapsed and maybe fatally yeah. uh, wounded, and yet they don't stop on the basis of an authority figure. Absolutely. When it comes to authority figures and when it comes to the status quo, people more often than not, it's it's a psychological ph phenomenon. They just go with the uh, with the flow, is what I, what I say. What yeah. everyone else is doing, yeah. as opposed to questioning what they're doing. And that's the issue. I, I think it's incumbent upon you to question everything and to use your own intuition. Because more often than not, if we look at history, the majority has been on the wrong side. We have a look at slavery. That mm. took 400 years to turn. Mm. And it was exactly the same situation we have in some regards like homosexuality over here. The majority of the public was saying, that's completely wrong. How dare you go against the, yeah. the, the, the natural way of things? And it took a long time for people to change their attitude. Because everyone else was saying, oh, this is too hard. Well, that be fear of awkward. being ostracized from your culture exactly. is one of the most, um, the strongest motivations that people go through. As exactly. well as uh, increase of pleasure or decrease of pain. Absolutely. And it is, my con same con it is my contention that that same thing happens here in a lot of situations. 
Uh, I think it it falls into the whole spectrum of animal cruelty, how mm-hmm. so many people facilitate that with their daily actions, and not necessarily because they they feel it's it's right or wrong, but because they just go with what everyone else is doing. Yeah, and uh, I think it's incumbent upon us to like because they want to fit in more than they w- exactly more. that whole tribal uh, urge to fit in, and it's a hard thing to break out of. It is, but I think it's I think it's impossible to get rid of. I think it's it's inherent and important to survivability, but it is possible to get to points where you say, my part of me is telling me to go with the flow, but I can't, that regardless a, of how I end up. That is a good point, brother. Alex, uh, let's let's wind this thing up, brother. I think we should call it, brother. Let's I call it a day. Yeah, we've been doing this for well over an hour, and I have enjoyed this, man. It's been a, I think we've had a great conversation, yeah. man. It's been, it's been awesome, and, and the flow has been fantastic. Absolutely. Listen, um, if people want to get in touch with you, they want to connect with you on a psychedelic level, uh, if you want to share your, your on, Facebook? On any level whatsoever, I'd love to hear what people have to say about these conversations. Absolutely. Um, my Twitter is Alexander Boyd, without the R on Alexander. And mm. my Facebook is... Alexander D? Yeah, like Alexander Boyd. Yeah, That's pretty cool, right? Alexander was taken, unfortunately. Mm. Um, my Facebook is Alex Boyd, and... I don't know, hit me up. Absolutely. Find, find me on Tinder. Yeah, well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, be sure to... Uh, <laughs> yeah, to comment on this stuff, because this thing is only fun when other people are getting involved, like uh, a whole tribal society. Well, you know? it's, yeah, I mean, the more the more opinions is... Yeah. Opens totally because we, we want to maintain our individuality in some sense but we still need that tribal community going on so <laughs> people I, I i urge you to share the hell out of this and to, uh, to comment and let us know what you think of my crazy ideas um how awesome alex's crazy salient points were and uh, yeah hopefully we can continue to cr- create our own little community over here uh until next time everyone this is the crystal journey podcast where i have the uh, Non-versations more often than not. I need to shut up more, but I like to uh, pick <laughs> the brain. Did you say a non-versation? Yes. I like that. A, I've never yeah, heard that before. Yeah, it's another thing I do. I hear these yeah. ideas and I throw them. I hope you start using that one as well. Oh, I might. Yeah. Mind. And, uh, yeah, obviously like to keep people posted with what I'm doing. i got my music video coming out very soon. I'm about to launch it probably next week. It's looking really, really cool. It's exciting, brother. It is exciting. I'll show you a little, uh, little clip a bit later Sneak. after I Sneak end this thing. Preview. Yeah, so ladies and gentlemen, don't drive, don't text. Uh, peace out. Keep it real. Until next time. Uh, yeah, peace out. Ow. Hey, 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 hey. Let me get my music flowing out of here. Why isn't my mouse responding? It's and terrible. What a terrible outro. Well, here in we the meantime, here we go. Maybe we can just keep. Sweet! That was good, man. Our deepest fear is not that we are an addict. Our deepest fear is that we are an addict.